What do you want, sweetie? For robots to be free. How about ice cream? Ice cream is here. Good. Which one do you want? Gareth Edwards, the mastermind behind Rogue One and 2014's Godzilla, returned to the director's chair with the creator, a deep dive into the burgeoning and often contentious dialogue with artificial intelligence. While not without its flaws, which we'll get into at the end of the video, with a budget of $80 million, he paints a beautifully crafted world split in two, with the West waging war against the East over a shadowy AI, rumored to be the downfall of humanity. Our protagonist Joshua, a battle-hardened American soldier with more ghosts than a haunted house, is on a mission to hunt down the AI threat, but what he discovers will force him to confront his past demons. The creator isn't your run-of-the-mill sci-fi action flick, it's a thought-provoking journey loaded with heart and soul. Edwards brings a narrative that not only dazzles with its visuals, but also strikes a chord with its themes, echoing real-world discussions on AI's burgeoning role in our lives. Split into the classic five-act structure, the film opens with exposition to transport us into this new world. Artificial intelligence has been incorporated into American society to make things easier for mankind. By studying the human brain, they were able to give independent thought and life to robots, enabling them to join the workforce. People were also now able to scan their facial features and sell it, giving the new iteration of robots called simulants a more human-like appearance. They cook our meals. They drive our cars. They are civil servants. But in 2055, a nuclear warhead was detonated in Los Angeles by the AI, incinerating over a million people. In response, robots were banned in the Western world, while the republics of New Asia continued to develop them, even seeing them as equals. The trillion-dollar military space station, the USS North American Orbital Mobile Aerospace Defense, is eventually created to scan for signs of AI and wipe them out. A permanent fixture over New Asia, it is being used to systematically halt AI's last stand, the intention is to both eliminate them and find the so-called Namata, the creator of the new generations of AI. We pick up 10 years later with Joshua Taylor, a former sergeant of the West and amputee, now living in Konang with his pregnant wife, Maya. Wait, I mean, you are 100% sure on the... If it starts acting like a dick, you can feel pretty confident. Raised by simulants, Maya has an affinity for AI, seeing them as equals. We see her and Josh muse over the prospective intellect and disposition of their unborn progeny. Yet this light-hearted banter is abruptly curtailed as the serene sanctuary of their island home becomes a battleground for an invasive onslaught. Led by Harun, the simulants drag one of the enemy soldiers into their home, asking how they found them, and realizing that Nomad was approaching to wipe them out, they begin to flee to the boats. Demonstrating a tactical acumen, Maya proposes the retention of their captive as leverage. Josh, on the other hand, advocates for a more terminal resolution. But when she leaves to recover her things, we learn that Josh was actually undercover. You were gonna give me more time! Kill Nomada. Nomada's not here. Something that Maya overhears. The revelation that he was still in the military taints their relationship, casting long shadows over the authenticity of their bond. Josh implores her to go with him, insisting they don't want her but Nomata, before claiming that simulants weren't real, unlike their relationship and baby that's on the way. In a final gut-wrenching turn, his eyes bear witness to the brutal might of Nomad. The fleeing boats carrying Maya and her synthetic kin become the unwilling recipients of Nomad's wrath. Maya! With the hunt for Namata continuing in New Asia five years later, we kick on with the second act's rising action called The Creator. Going through rehabilitation whilst also undergoing lie detector examinations, Josh tells the doctor he doesn't know Nomata's location, but the night of the extraction is always on his mind. Your source dying. Why? We were married. This Trying his best to move on, he's now working as part of a cleanup crew in the ruins of Los Angeles. Child, get out, where get is she? While his partner is shaken to see the robot behaving like a human, Joss disables it and maintains they don't feel anything and we're just programming. It's here that we cut to a flashback of Maya helping Josh get accustomed to his prosthetics, learning the origin of his hatred towards AI. Not only did he lose his limbs, but his parents and brother were instantly incinerated at ground zero. Back in the present, Josh is approached by General Andrews and Colonel Howell, who explain they've located Namada's lab in the area he once was undercover. The creator has essentially developed a superweapon called Alpha O, designed to destroy Nomad. Alluding to the plight of the Neanderthal, which were wiped out by humans, they insist that the destruction of Nomad will see the end of humanity. While he tells them he lost a wife and child due to their incompetence and walks away, they get his attention with footage of Harun and Maya, whom they say are still alive. Realizing they're going to indiscriminately destroy the base, he agrees to lead them, so long as he was allowed to bring Maya back. 
We've got a location on the lab, which, as you can see, is way behind enemy lines. Our mission is to find the weapon designated Alpha O. Then we call in a missile strike from Nomad and blow it up. On their way there, Hal reveals her resentment towards AI, stemmed from the death of their boys, who were both killed in the war. One of them fell for a simulant in Hawaii, and you believe that? Just took their sweet time killing him. With Joshua explaining they built a town over the base, the team begin terrorizing the locals for information, before he unearths a trap door. The following onslaught is horrific, with the team slaughtering human lab technicians and robotic police without mercy, as Josh looked for Maya. I'll be back here before this thing opens. Do not go in there without me. With the men eventually pinned down, he makes his way into the sealed vault containing the weapon alone, and is shocked to discover a child watching TV. Letting his guard down, he's shot by an injured lab tech that pleads with the child to escape using the hatch. Parallel to this, Hal, a figure of authority and determination, confronts a harrowing choice. With the shadow of Nomad's missile strike looming ominously, she ventures into the fray to support her beleaguered troops. But as the bird flew away, a bomb that was fired at one of the soldiers goes off, bringing it crashing to the ground. Emerging from the hatch, Joshua takes but a fleeting breeze of freedom before being vanquished by the concussive embrace of Nomad's wrath. Waking up in the third act titled The Child, he finds a simulant kid standing over him. Telling her to go away, he runs into the field and finds Shipley, who survived the crash but was severely injured. Taking him to an abandoned house, he finds a child had followed him and that she has some remarkable powers. Getting a call from Hal, he explains the weapon is actually a child. The colonel tells him to bring it to her, but when he clarifies Shipley's in bad shape and that he didn't have an exit strategy, he's ordered to kill the simulant. Before he can argue with her, Hal is captured by the police along with Captain McBride and taken away. At the same time, a new Asian officer finds them and marvels at the simulant child. Proclaiming her to be a miracle, he prepares to kill Josh, but is beaten to the punch. It, do it doesn't die, it's off. It just turned it off, like the TV. Same thing, it's not dead, it's off. Calling the child Little Sim, our protagonist asks if she knew where Maya was, and is told she's in Dian Yang. But before he can get more answers, they're surrounded by police, forcing the trio to escape by truck, with help from the child, who uses her power to start the vehicle. Meanwhile, Howl and McBride daringly commandeer the police vehicle and begin looking for them. Although Shipley orders him to go to the base when their truck breaks down, Josh explains the nearest one was over 400 miles away and that they wouldn't even make it past checkpoints. Give me a chance, man. I, I'm trying to, all right? I'm trying to save your life. Insisting he had a friend in the capital that could help them, he and the child watch as Shipley begins to succumb to his wounds. Uh. So you speak English now? With a van stopping in front of them, Josh tells the child to pretend she's human indicating he still only saw her as a robot. Giving her the name Alfie, they leave with the family just before Hal and McBride find the truck. Using high-tech equipment, they manage to scan the brain of Shipley and resurrect his consciousness into the body of a simulant. He's been dead for hours. We'll be lucky to get 30 seconds. I'm on and talk to my wife. Shipley, was the weapon terminated? <laughs> Discovering that Josh and the weapon were gone, they brand him as a traitor and begin their hunt, learning the pair were spotted heading to Lilat City. While Josh continues to see the child as a robot, Alfie begins to slowly change his perspective. Hey, little bot, pay attention. My name is not Bot. My name is Alfie, remember? Taking a train to the city, the two have an insightful discussion about family and life. Alfie asks about his parents, and he reveals they were in heaven, a peaceful place in the sky. But when she asks if he was going to heaven, he tells her he can't as he's not a good person. We can't go to heaven because you're not good, and I'm not a person. Not only making him feel guilty about the way he's been treating her, but also slowly beginning to chip away at his perception of AI. As we proceed into the fourth act housing the falling action titled The Friend, we discover the friend he was talking about was Drew, the captured soldier in Act 1. Drew wasn't just a good friend, but his handler. However, he since changed his opinion on robots, and even has a simulant girlfriend called Cammy. Examining Alfie, Drew is shocked to discover that she was unlike any simulant he'd ever seen, with the capability to grow into an adult. He also determines her powers would grow, enabling her to remotely control all technology anywhere on the planet, which is why the West was so terrified of her. The creator kind of reminded me of Blade Runner, not just in its visual style, but also in its thematic depth. Both deal with beings created by humans, replicants in Blade Runner and simulants in the creator, that are hunted and eventually lead the protagonist to realize their humanity. Through its portrayal of Joshua and Alfie's journey into the city, the film underscores the notion that AI, while not physically human, possess distinct personalities, desires, hopes, dreams, and fears. This realization for Joshua is pivotal, mirroring Deckard's transformation in Blade Runner. 
Both characters shift from a mindset of division to one of understanding and empathy, albeit at different stages in their respective narratives. Unfortunately, when Cammy orders ice cream for Alfie, it's intercepted by the police, who plan to bomb in the container that kills her. This leads to Josh effectively John Wicking them in a pretty epic showdown, before leaving with Alfie and the distraught Drew. Using a tracker to follow the ring Josh gave Maya, they trace it back to their old home, but Drew is shot in the back by enemy forces before making a confession. It wasn't her father, it was her. This was the reason they didn't hold off on the attack. With Drew dead, the pair run off to the beach where they're captured by Harun and the simulants, propelling us into the fifth and final act containing the resolution, titled The Mother. Here, Harun reveals that the Los Angeles detonation wasn't actually an attack by AI, but a man-made coding error that was blamed on the robots. The twist serves as a critique of reactionary military actions and government deceit. Joshua's character embodies this theme, as he initially believes in the propaganda, only to realize its fallacy. Still, while Harun tells him that AI would never harm humanity, he maintains that he cannot bring him to Namata as the West is following him to find her. Approaching their hideout, they're horrified to see it obliterated by Nomad, giving Josh the opportunity to escape and overhear their plan for Alfie. Given the range of her power still growing, Arun plans on getting her up to Nomad to destroy it, and admits that she won't survive. This no doubt aggravates some of the simulants who don't want to sacrifice her for the cause. But it will turn the tide of the war. Does she even know what she's been created for? Finding Alfie and deactivating Harun, Josh prepares to leave, but an attack from Hal's cavalry sends her running off to protect the simulants. With the resistance destroying one of the two gigantic tanks, Hal deploys robotic bombs to blow them up. While the first one takes out a few people, Alfie approaches the second bomb, which slows down and bows its head, enabling her to deactivate it. Unfortunately, McBride appears and shoots her, forcing Josh to kill him. With the bomb now reactivated, it destroys the bridge, enabling Josh, Alfie, Harun and the rest of them to flee to the temple containing Namata. Here the simulant reveals that Maya had created Alfie using a scanned embryo of their unborn child, essentially making Alfie Josh's daughter. She could have made her to hate mankind, perhaps she should have. Maya's creation of Alfie was a monumental leap in AI. Unlike her predecessors that were merely carbon copies, Alfie represented a new breed, an AI capable of physical and mental evolution, bridging the gap between humans and simulants. Her ambition was more than just liberation for the simulants, it was about forging a new path, especially with the emergence of Alfie's extraordinary capabilities. And when Josh enters the temple, he discovers the truth about Maya, who has been in a coma since the attack five years prior. Is this Dande? Dianda means heaven. While assuring that death would bring her rebirth, it was impossible for the simulants to harm Nemata, and so, begging Maya to forgive him, he and Alfie say goodbye as he pulls the plug to finally give her peace. Goodbye, mother. I love you. With Hal's team finding them and indiscriminately killing simulants, humans, and even children, she finds Josh and offers him a clean slate if he gave up the child. When Hal scans Maya's brain using a transference device to get more information, Harun places a bomb on her back. And while Alfie momentarily disarms it, when her soldiers aim their guns at Alfie and Josh, the bomb goes off, killing Hal and her men. Colonel Hal's game plan was simple and brutal, annihilate all AI no matter the cost. Her deception about Maya's survival was a calculated move, not out of concern for Joshua, but as a strategic ploy. Seeing Maya as an adversary, she was irked by Joshua's deep attachment to her, yet she was cunning enough to leverage this to her advantage. His determination to find Maya made him the perfect tool, capable of infiltrating and gaining the necessary trust. But Hal's game plan was riddled with hubris, a manipulation ultimately leading to her downfall. Told to destroy Nomad by Harun, Josh and Alfie run away and witness the death of their friends, only to then be captured and brought back to Los Angeles. Luckily, the humans are unable to terminate Alfie, as she won't let them. Explaining that we're going to resort to painful methods, as the girl trusted him, the general offers Joshua a chance to kill her humanely using an EMP gun. And whispering something to Alfie, Josh pulls the trigger and asks to be there when they incinerate the simulant. I'd like to be there for that. It's not a funeral. It is to me, General. When the general discovers that he merely told her to stand by, Alfie wakes up and deactivates the vehicle carrying them, enabling the pair to escape and board a lunar module. Redirecting it to Nomad, they begin their mission to destroy it. With the general frantically ordering a strike on all the remaining AI bases, Alfie disables the facility, while Josh arms a bomb onto one of the missiles. Finding a simulant with Maya's likeness, Alfie puts her consciousness inside of it, but it appears to fail. The AI lab on the Nomad, the very weapon meant to annihilate her kind reeks of hypocrisy. 
Despite their vocal disdain for robots, the West was still dabbling with them. It's a stark revelation that their aim isn't to erase robots completely, but reboot their own that didn't have artificial intelligence. It's like finding out the fireman is also the arsonist. With Josh running out of oxygen in his suit and passing out, Alfie prepares the escape pod for them. Unfortunately, as the Nomad begins to blow up, disabling all the missiles on their way to eliminate the remaining bases, having run out of time, Josh tells Alfie that he's going to heaven because of her, and releases the pod, sending Alfie back to Earth. However, in his final moments, he stumbles upon the simulant that Alfie tried activating earlier. To his surprise, it's Maya effectively reborn, and the pair share a final embrace as Nomad is obliterated around them, ending the war. Ultimately, with New Asia celebrating the defeat of their oppressor, Alfie emerges from the pod with tears of happiness. Maya's dream for Alfie to be a herald of peace suddenly becomes tangible. The smile on Alfie's face is not just relief, it's the dawn of a new era, where AI and humans might just find a way to coexist peacefully. For me, Joshua's transformation regarding his view on AI is a focal point. Initially dismissive of simulants as sentient beings, Alfie leads him to an epiphany. Witnessing her compassion, protectiveness, and capability for feeling, his bond with her changes his position. And Alfie's very existence and burgeoning ability signal a seismic shift in AI's trajectory. She stands as a harbinger of a new era for AI, one that could redefine their role in human relationships, their contributions to the workforce, and their daily life globally. With Nomad out of the picture, Alfie's presence and abilities transcend mere hope. They could fundamentally alter the global perception of artificial intelligence, propelling them to new heights of evolution. I don't think anyone's ever seen anything like this before. There are all these special effects and everything, but at the heart of it is a beautiful story. Inside of a science fiction world, what dominates is the characters and the relationships and what people learn. Science fiction should always have some meat on the bone. What questions is it provoking about something important in the real world? In the intricate web of science fiction, humans entangled in an eternal waltz with robotics is far from new. But in the creator, it's not merely the utilitarian aspect of AI that stirs the pot. It's the unnerving thought of computers making autonomous decisions, charting paths without the need for our guiding hand, and eventually evolving beyond us. At its core, it's not just a tale of technological warfare, but a poignant odyssey of redemption. We're introduced to John David Washington's Joshua, a man ensnared by grief, his life a casualty to the draconian tactics of a government wielding fear as a manipulative tool. Enticing him with the prospect of reclaiming what was lost, the military fails to foresee the true journey Joshua embarks upon, one catalyzed through Alfie, a young simulant girl portrayed with captivating innocence by Madeline Yoon of Oils. To the United States, she's a weapon. To Joshua's former New Asian comrades, including the enigmatic Harun, brought to life by Ken Watanabe, she's a beacon of salvation. Yet for Joshua, she's a means to an end, a conduit to what he cherishes most, Maya, played by Gemma Chan. Joshua's initial stance on simulants, dismissed as mere lines of code, gradually erodes, not solely because of Alfie's childlike visage, but due to the humanity she unwittingly reflects. While his reluctance to harm her stems from a myriad of reasons, her innocence and the glimmer of hope that she might lead him to Maya hold him in a moral quandary. The trajectory of Joshua's sentiments towards Alfie transforms from a begrudging pity to a profound recognition of her personhood. Gareth Edwards, known for his unique visual flair, weaves this tale with a documentary-like authenticity, a signature that has coloured all of his works to date. When you say to someone, okay, we don't want to do this the normal way, we want to do it back to front, so we want to go shoot, imagine it's all there, and then do it in post. Because like, say a budget for a movie is normally this much, and then they keep about that much as a safety net. Like, let's go make the movie with this, and have this as the backup insurance. Obviously there are actors that are reading lines, and it's a script that everybody knows of the arc and the character arc and the story. But from a technical standpoint, from a crewing standpoint, and from an equipment standpoint, we had to treat it like it was a documentary in order to be able to kind of properly give Gareth and his actors the bubble that they needed to be able to kind of make the, the film that they wanted to. When people say a documentary style in terms of drama, what they're really referring to, I think, is a much more organic, reactive approach. The technical artistry and brilliance of Greg Frazier and Oren Sofa's cinematography transforms the film into a visual sonnet. Their ability to capture the perilous beauty of the world, set against the natural backdrops of Thailand, Vietnam, Nepal, Japan and Cambodia, is a tribute to the natural beauty of those regions and to the medium of film. The landscapes, sprawling and wild, serve not just as a setting but as a silent narrator, chronicling the odyssey of Joshua and Alfie through their sweeping vistas. 
The secluded haven of Simulant, nestled within these breathtaking landscapes, is so vividly portrayed that one begins to feel ensnared by its haunting allure. The film masterfully merges the rustic charm of earthly landscapes with the high-octane sheen of technology. Amid the pastoral tranquility of grain fields, the film neatly weaves in robots and simulants, their presence a subtle nod to their assimilation into the societal fabric. It was important that the lighting represented an urban environment and not a film environment. If we can give the audience less and less reason to disbelieve and know the environment that they're in, I think the more success the visuals of the film will have. It is a definite challenge building these worlds from scratch because they've not existed before. You're not making part of a franchise that has preceding stories or, or stories that exist after it. It's tough, but you know what's exciting about it is that you get to make it up and no one can tell you that you're wrong either. I basically lent on a lot of friends from the other films I'd made and was like, can you do some images? So all these images started to trickle in. So I ended up with like too many images. We wanted a used universe more than anything. We wanted something that felt that you can walk around a corner and you can see this new world, but it still felt grounded. It still felt earthly. This understated portrayal underscores their acceptance as co-inhabitants of this world, while also showcasing the filmmaker's prowess and blending the fantastical seamlessly with the real. The technical wizardry behind the creator is further accentuated by the revelation of its humble cinematic tools. The Sony FX3, accessible to the average consumer, serves as a chariot for this visual odyssey, challenging the conventional reliance on more opulent cameras. With the FX3, particularly at this point in time for this film, it was like a, a light bulb moment when we tested that camera and realized that it definitely did have a little bit of grain to it, but that grain was visually very interesting. This is gonna be boring for a lot of people, right? You ready? It has, it has really good color science. So the skin tones versus the world is a really, you can really bend it to the, what looks like a Kodak film stock very easily. And uh, it's got, it shoots at 12,800 ISO. So you can film in nearly moonlight. Um, and it's incredibly light, like it's tiny. So you put it on a gimbal and you can hold it all day. It doesn't get tiring. Like trying to do that with an Arri is quite a nightmare. Basically they took all the color science from their higher end camera they had that they make feature films with. They put it in this kind of prosumer camera that you can buy in the shops. And it was like, perfect, this is it. Gareth knew that he wanted to shoot anamorphic. So then the question was, okay, what is the lightest weight vintage anamorphic lens out there that had the aesthetic look that he was after? So they found the, the, the Koa um, 75 millimeter. Basically, it's not perfect. If you look at the edges, it's not in focus and things like this. And I love that. That's kind of what a painting does. Beautiful paintings, then they've not got detail everywhere. Like a, a great image says, look at this. Not this, this. And a great lens, I think, will do that. To me, this choice revealed that the essence of visual storytelling lies in its vision, not in the price tag of the tools employed. The illumination of each frame in the creator is a visual delight, with Frazier, Soffer, and gaffer Johnny Franklin conjuring a visual symphony that sings praises to the alchemy of light and shadow. The collaborative genius manages to marry humanity with machinery in a delicate dance of light. The director's adeptness at infusing soul into the still frames of robots and AI elevates the film beyond a mere visual spectacle. It's this emotional undercurrent that propels the creator, transforming it from a tale of technological conflict into a saga of sentient synergy. The film's portrayal of technology, with its wear and lived-in authenticity, conjures a future that feels tantalizingly tangible. The auditory landscape of the creator is no less remarkable. The legendary Hans Zimmer orchestrates a sonic masterpiece, each note resonating with the emotional depth and peril of the narrative. Zimmer's score, coupled with the characters and their relationships, however fleeting or half-formed, adds a pulsating heart to the film's technological skeleton. The auditory experience is further enriched by the stellar sound mixing and editing, a symphony of sonic precision that breathes life into the AI entities, lending them an uncanny realism. I think the biggest philosophical guideline in terms of the visual approach to this film was, was around this idea of how do you make something artificial feel organic? Or how do you make something staged feel spontaneous? And Greg and Gareth described it as this razor's edge that you're always chasing. And on one side of that edge is something that is too perfect and too artificial, too lit, too designed. And when you are on that side of the edge, when an image looks 100% perfect, it feels fake. But on the other side of that razor is uncurated, and it's just raw, rough. There's no beauty to it. We still wanted 
wanted the film to, to be beautiful and to look cinematic. So finding that razor's edge was the whole game of the shoot. At its heart, the film is a poignant exploration of humanity's propensity to marginalize and dominate the other. Through the character of Colonel Howe, portrayed by Alison Janney, the film draws a stark parallel between the contemporary human-AI dynamic and the historical obliteration of Neanderthals by early humans. Set against the backdrop of a world where the West zealously brands AI as a harbinger of doom, the creator unveils a contrasting reality in New Asia. Here, robots and humans aren't just cohabitants, they're partners in a shared evolutionary journey, challenging the ominous narrative spun by those in power. It goes without saying that the creator wears its inspirations on its sleeve, paving homage to influential works of the genre. The simulant child Alfie echoes the haunted visage of Tetsuo from Akira, while her bond with Joshua resonates with the heartfelt dynamics of Paper Moon and Rain Man. In addition to this, the film's visual and thematic language is a melange of Blade Runner's dystopian aesthetic and the haunting echoes of Apocalypse Now. The film posits a future where simulants harbor a desire not for domination, but for a harmonious existence with its human creators. But as the narrative crescendos towards its climax, the film shifts focus from grandiose schemes to the redemptive arcs of its central characters. Joshua's journey towards self-redemption and Alfie's demonstration of an empathetic soul, surpassing that of her human counterparts, form the emotional core of the conclusion. I'm going to heaven. No! I'll meet you there. No! No! Among the film's most striking elements is the USS Nomad, a government vessel that looms ominously as a symbol of omnipotent surveillance and destruction. Its ability to obliterate with clinical precision underscores the chilling reality of modern warfare. Yet amidst this backdrop of high-stakes conflict, the creator finds its soul in the intimate narrative threads, Joshua's haunted past, Alfie's childlike innocence, and the transformative power of empathy and understanding that binds them together. The film offers Washington a chance to showcase his comedic flair, albeit in fleeting moments. His portrayal, steeped in a character grappling with profound grief, hints at depths unexplored, leaving the audience yearning for a fuller realization of his persona. The film also seems to walk on a tightrope, balancing between contrasting tonal aspirations. On one hand, it flirts with the lightheartedness of Star Wars, while on the other, it ventures into the gritty, philosophically rich terrains akin to children of men. The oscillation, while ambitious, sometimes leaves the film in liminal space, wavering between identities and not wholly claiming either. The narrative and character arcs are also not without their faults. For example, the decision for the general to entrust Joshua with the task of disarming Alfie strikes a dissonant chord, especially against the backdrop of them displaying an unflinching ruthlessness towards AI. In moments like this, I couldn't help but feel it's merely a contrivance to facilitate the next plot point. Furthermore, the film's orbit seems to revolve predominantly around Joshua, Alfie, Harun and Drew, leaving the remaining constellation of characters in shadows. Especially Maya, who, while fascinating, is only seen in brief flashbacks until the end, where she dies once again. While the script of the creator is a medley of compelling ideas and sequences, it occasionally falters, leaving the audience with a sense of missing pieces. Certain pivotal scenes seem to lack the contextual backbone needed to fully resonate, creating a subtle dissonance with the film's overarching narrative intent. This gap, while not gaping, was enough to occasionally pull me out of the film's otherwise immersive world. I also felt that it tread a familiar path in the sci-fi landscape, occasionally stumbling into telling and not showing. The script at times seems overly eager to hold our hand, articulating motivations and desires that are already vividly etched into the context. The characters, though brimming with potential, sometimes retreat into the comfort of archetypical shells. Alison Janney's colonel with her single-minded drive for vengeance, Joshua's vociferous quest for his wife Maya, and Alfie's incessant proclamation for robot liberation, reiterating the obvious with a fervor that borders on redundancy. This narrative insistence, while aiming for clarity, inadvertently nudges the film towards a terrain of frustration. Despite these narrative hiccups, the creator paints a visually rich and immersive world, and the action sequences are orchestrated with finesse. The backdrop is a meticulously crafted canvas, though it shies away from delving into the deeper philosophical or political currents that underpin its world. With its keen eye for cinematic grandeur, Gareth Edwards infuses the creator with a palpable sense of scale and spectacle. Yet the screenplay, a collaborative creation with Chris White, occasionally succumbs to the gravitational pull of sci-fi tropes, casting shadows of predictability over its narrative landscape. While the film delivers its revelations and plot twists with a flair, some moments yearn for a more nuanced touch, their potential intensity and urgency somewhat eclipsed by the surrounding spectacle. Nevertheless, the creator stands as a testament to production innovation. Crafted on a budget that contradicts its visual opulence, the film is a masterclass in budgetary discipline and creative resourcefulness. 
Its commitment to on-location filming, augmented by post-production digital artistry, sets it apart from the prevalent green screen paradigm in bloated budgets in Hollywood. It is a really exciting to think that you could approach movie making in a completely different way. The more you can make movies for less money, the more freedom you get, the more risks you can take, and therefore hopefully films can become more interesting. The most important thing is to tell your story. It doesn't have to be expensive, it's about the choices. Those choices are determined by your creative point of view and your process. It's this new way of approaching things, doing things completely differently with technology that never existed before. Go do stuff with that. Go change everything. Like break the rules, go make it all on your own terms with how you think a movie should be made. In a cinematic landscape often dominated by franchises, the creator emerges as a beacon of somewhat original storytelling and visual splendor. No matter's not here. I'm undercover. You gotta call off the raid. What about the others? They're my family. They're not real. Sergeant Taylor. My police. <laughs> 